Lemuria's go the credits of carving out a vast territorial empire and also establishing a strong firm administrative systems at different administrative tiers at least for a century of their existence. Yet the consolidation of this vast empire could not merely be achieved by far-flung conquests and a firm administrative machinery. It would require something more to act as a coalescent to cement the diversity of the empire. The diversity is not to be rooted out or stamped out, but it required an ideology that would act as an overarching principle amidst various diversities, diversities in ethnic situations, diversities in religious beliefs and practices, different levels of socio-economic experiences, linguistic differences. All these have to be taken into consideration and yet placed over placed under an overarching ideological concept. It goes to the immense credit of the Mauryas, especially Ashoka, to formulate an ideology of the state for the first time in Indian history. This is Ashoka's Dhamma, to which we now our attention will be on. The term Dhamma figures repeatedly in Ashoka's inscriptions and in fact is the very theme of his edicts. What the term means? That Pali or Prakrit term Dhamma is certainly equiv equivalent to the Sanskrit term Dharma, which we often mean in a straightforward sense of religious belief of a person or the religious belief of a group of persons. Did Ashok use the term Dhamma in the sense of his personal religion? What was his personal religion? There is little doubt that Ashoka was a devout Buddhist. That is pretty clear from the study of his edicts and also from a large number of later Buddhist texts, legends, anecdotes concerning the charismatic figure of Ashoka. Let us have a look at that. In addition to the well-known Buddhist legend that Ashoka converted to Buddhism, he himself states in his own edict that he became a lay follower of the, of the creed of the Buddha. He calls himself an Upasaka or a Buddhupasaka. He also admits that after his conversion for the first one year, he was not very much exerting and later in the next one and a half years, he became more zealous in his practice of his Dhamma, that is Buddhism. Like a devout, true like a devout Buddhist, he pays visits of homage to some sacred places associated with Buddhism like Lumbini Grama, the place of the nativity of the master. He visits Sambodhi or Bodhgaya, the place of the enlightenment of the master. He also visited several other Buddhist stupas and also viharas, which are all recorded in his edicts. These were, in his own statements, missions and tours of dhamma, dhamma yata. Sometimes he was away from his capital for as many as 256 nights on such tours. Ashoka is also known in later Buddhist text and is remembered by 
the 7th century famous Chinese Buddhist pilgrim, Zhuan Sang, to have constructed as many as 84,000 Buddhist stupas. We do not know how far these stories are factually correct, but we also know that Ashoka had definite concerns about Buddhism. That is why in an edict, he lays down as many as seven Buddhist canonical texts. This is Binaya Samukase, Aliya Vasani, Anagata Bhayani, Muni Gatha, Muneo Sute, Lahula Bada and Upatisapasine. Not only does he prescribe this text for the monks and nuns to read them carefully, it also shows that he was fully aware of and conversant in the Buddhist canonical texts. We also know from the edict at Bhairat how Ashoka was perturbed at the possibility of a breakup in the Buddhist Sangha, some dissent in the Buddhist Sangha, and he issues very stern measures against those monks and nuns who would try to create a division, a dissension, a breakup in the Sangha. All these would indicate that he was a devout Buddhist in his personal religious beliefs and practices. If we add to that the already known celebrated literary texts in later Buddhism like the Divyavadana, the Ashokavadana, it shows him as a very pious devoted Buddhist ruler who caused for the propagation of Buddhism to faraway lands definitely to Sri Lanka where he is said to have sent his son and daughter for the propagation of Buddhism. Taking all these things into consideration, there emerges a very popular view and a notion that Ashoka was not merely a pious Buddhist in his personal life, but actually was a Buddhist ruler. In other words, it implies that Ashoka turned Buddhism from his own personal belief into the state religion. Buddhism almost becomes, according to this view, equivalent to the state ideology of Ashoka. If we look at a well-known book by Stanley J. Tambia, The World Conqueror and the World Renouncer, in which Tambia considers Ashoka as the paradigmatic Buddhist ruler, Dhammika Dhamma Raja. Can we have some other insights into Ashoka's Dhamma? If we look at his inscriptions along with his definite allegiance to Buddhism as a personal creed, he however remains completely silent in his inscriptions on some fundamental tenets of Buddhism, like the concept of the four noble truths or Arya Satyas. He is completely silent on that. He never says a word in his edicts on another very significant tenet of Buddhism that is the Eightfold Path or Ashtangika Marga. He is completely silent on Nirvana, the ultimate goal of a Buddhist. In fact, he emphasizes on the attainment of heaven, swaga or sarga in his edicts. If we now turn our attention to the Aramaic and Greek edicts, where he also discusses about his dhamma, what he says there, what is the term for dhamma? After all, dhamma is a Prakrit word. What he says in his Greek and Aramaic edicts. The terms in the Aramaic text is data, which means law, and kasit, which means truth. 
in the Greek text, the equivalent term for Dhamma is Eusebia, which means piety. It is plainly visible that in this translations of Dhamma into Greek and Aramaic, he never brings the term Buddhism or anything related to Buddhism. So, there is something much more broad based in his concept of Dhamma, which is translated as Data and Kasit in Aramaic and as Eusebia in Greek than mere Buddhism. Ashoka's personal leanings to Buddhism is not in doubt, but the policy of Dhamma that he propagates in his edicts is perhaps something more than his personal belief in Buddhism. What is that? The problem is Ashok does not himself define what is Dhamma, but there are certain features that emerge out of the study of certain words found in his edicts. We will like to make a detailed study of this concept. His Dhamma has one of the most important ingredients of the emphasis on non-violence and avoidance of injury to other men and also any other living being. Keeping with this policy, he stops the beating of the war drum, Bheri Ghosha, and replaces it with the reverberation of the drum of Dhamma, Dhamma Ghosha. By this, he eschews war. He categorically says that one of the fundamental principles of Dhamma is non-injury to living beings. We also know that in his understanding of Dhamma, he completely bans the trips for royal hunting, Vihara Yatra, and brings in instead the concept of the tours of piety, Dhamma Yatra or Dhamma Yata. Along with that, he categorically says that earlier, many animals and birds were regularly slaughtered for the royal kitchen. The number in his time has been drastically reduced. He says now only two peacocks and one animal are daily slaughtered. Please note that he is not telling that it has been entirely taken out. He is honest enough to admit that even three animals are slaughtered every day, but promises that that practice will be stopped very soon in near future. In his Lagman edict, Aramaic Lagman edict in the year 16 since his coronation, he categorically says that he has banished those who are excessive lovers of hunting and fishing. And then 11 years later, in the year 27 since his coronation, he puts a large list of animals and birds which were exempted from slaughtering or being killed. So, Ashok puts in principle the policy of non-injury to living beings not at a blanket ban, but in several stages. And what is at the fundamental principle in this particular attitude and the sets of action? He states in his edicts that no living being is to be sustained by another living being, jivena jive no pusitavye. With this is connected in the Dhamma program, for the first time in Indian history, the institution of medical practices, both for men, manusa chikicha, and for even beasts, posu chikicha. If we look at 
a few more further statements of Ashoka in his edicts on Dhamma, we find that he lists a number of virtues to be practiced for the upkeep of Dhamma. What are these? These are little sin, aposinave, many meritorious deeds, bahukayane, charity or liberality, dane, truthfulness, sache, kindness, daya, purity, sochay. And along with that, he also instructs that his subjects should avoid some of the vices. And these vices are violence, chandiye, cruelty, nitulye, anger, kodhe, pride, mane, jealousy, isya. The essential elements of dhamma in his edicts is that he urges his subjects to practice self-restraint, sayame, mental purity, bhavasudhi and gratefulness, kitanata. The practice of dhamma is actually to enhance the essence of all sects, saravadhi. Hence, he denounces in his edicts the practice of praising one's own religious sect and making disparaging comments about others' sects because he says by doing that you actually harm your own sect. So, in the idea of Dhamma of Ashoka, there is a clear spirit of accommodation, of diversity and recognition of plurality. This is, these are essential ingredients of Dhamma and there is no sectarian approach at all in spite of the fact that in his personal life he is a devout Buddhist. Dhamma is not merely some broad principle, it is to be practiced even in daily life. That is why Ashok says that within the program of Dhamma, one has to be respectful to parents, teachers, elders. One must honor alike Brahmanas, Shramanas, Nirgranthas or Jainas and Ajivikas. We shall see later how Ashoka and also a later Maurya ruler Dasharatha constructed rock shelters for the Ajivika monks at Baravar caves near Gaya. One has to keep in mind that there are many noted instances of intense debates on philosophical and religious matters between the Buddhists on the one hand and the Jainas and the Ajivikas on the other. But that this did not prevent Ashoka to arrange for some facilities of the Jainas and Ajivika monks, particularly the Ajivika monks. It is with this end in view that he specifically appointed a special class of officers, Dhamma Mahamatras, Mahamatras in charge of the propagation of the law of piety. Ashok also enjoins upon his subjects to cultivate kind attitude to the weak, the miserly, slaves and servants. Therefore, his policy of Dhamma emphasizes on the welfare of people in general, cutting across all social barriers and welfare of all sects. It is not merely directed at the propagation of Buddhist Sangha and Buddhist ideas. Along with that, Ashok banned Samaja, a particular type of social gathering in which, according to the Arthashastra, many licentious behaviors, drinking, revelry took place. Ashok did not approve of it and banned the Samaja. He also found the performance of certain rituals, Mangalas, as trivial and once again banned this and replaced the Mangalas with Dhamma Mangala. His idea regarding the propagation of Dhamma 
has really nothing to do specifically with Buddhist principle. These are concepts and typical practices, very broad based principles cutting across sectarian differences. Ashoka himself considered that what he tried to inculcate in the principles of Dhamma was based on ancient usages and customs, Puranapokiti. And with the principles of Dhamma, he was sure that he could bring in happiness for his subjects in this world, Hidalokika, and also in the next world, Palalokika. That is why his immortal statement that by the practice of Dhamma, he could consider all his subjects as his children, Sabe Muni Se Pajamama. So, in Dhamma, we find a broad based moral and ethical code of conducts. This was first pointed out in 1952 by K. A. Nilakanta Shastri. This point was elaborated, refined, and, find, and further analyzed by Ramila Thapar in several of her publications on the Mauryas. I would like to quote a particular passage from Ramila Thapar in this context. I quote, in the propagation of Dhamma, Ashoka was attempting to reform the narrow attitude to religious teachings, to protect the weak against the strong, and to promote throughout the empire a conscious social behavior so broad in its scope that no cultural group could object to it." Unquote. In keeping with this view, Bidhi Chattopadhyay in his book, Studying Early India, considers Ashoka's Dhamma as a unifier, not by obliterating diversities, but it acts as an overarching principle by accommodating plurality and diversity. Therefore, Dhamma as a policy, as an ideology of the state, as proposed and propagated by Ashoka, is far more broad based than Buddhism. And Dhamma here is definitely not identical with Buddhism. However, there is something more to that. In the recently discovered Greek edict of Ashok in Kandahar, we find a number of important facets, features, practices of Eusebia as Ashok instructs. We have already stated that the term Eusebia in Greek stands for what Ashok meant by Dhamma in his Prakrit texts. Actually, this Greek edict on Eusebia is based on Ashoka's Rock Edict 12 and Rock Edict 13 in Prakrit, where many principles of Dhamma are laid down. Interestingly enough, only in this Greek edict comes a peculiar statement. One of the virtues to be practiced by the subjects in course of upholding of Dhamma or Eusebia is, I quote following B. N. Mukherjee's translation and comment, that one of the fundamental aspects of Eusebia or Dhamma was to mine the ruler's interests. Tato sum feranta basileos noi. This is in fact an elaboration of the Prakrit term Dhrabhatita, farm devotion already occurring in Rock Edict 13 in Prakrit. So, firm devotion to the ruler or the interest of the ruler is also one of the component features of Ashoka's Dhamma. Therefore, it is not merely a social philosophy, a very broad based code of moral and ethical conducts. It also has in it 
a political philosophy, the Ashok demands from his subjects complete allegiance to the ruler, to the interest of the ruler, and in his turn, he would act like a father to his subjects, the paternal attitude of the ruler to his subjects. This new element of Dhamma having a political philosophy along with the very broad based social and ethical principles is a new addition to our knowledge on Ashoka's Dhamma. That is why it is considered as an ideology of the state formulated and put into practice by Ashoka. In his Pillar Edict 1, Ashoka makes a statement which perhaps envelops or encapsulates his ideal of the practice of Dhamma. He says that he is to maintain by Dhamma, Dhammena Palana, to rule according to Dhamma, Dhammena Vidhana, to make people happy by Dhamma, Dhammena Sukhiyana, and to protect people according to Dhamma, Dhammena Gotiti. This is a unique concept and principle put to practice by Ashoka during his reign. Dhamma, once again let us repeat, is not equivalent to or identical with Buddhism, though Ashoka himself in his personal life was undoubtedly a pious and devout Buddhist. It is much more broad based than having a particular sectarian approach in his mind. It recognizes plurality, it considers the diversity of various cults, religious beliefs and systems and is very broad based. This was extremely necessary to keep in order so vast a realm. It is true that it was a unique experiment and it was not followed in the post Ashokan days, but even as an experiment, as an ideology, it has a lasting contribution to the Indian ethos, something we would like to celebrate and emulate even in our present circumstances and experience. Thank <music> you.